Everybody shout praise to God, would you? Okay, let me do an English lesson. Everybody means everybody, all right? Everybody shout praise to God this morning. Amen? Praise the Lord. Man. Maybe some of you had too many burritos this morning, huh? <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Children's Church is heading out, and we're heading in. We're going to lean into a message today. I want to say real quickly, I want to say a word of thanks and appreciation to 14 guys that ran around Alabama this weekend at the men's conference, Gridiron Men's Conference. If you're here and you went with me, say whoop. whoop. That's, that's pretty good. Hey, to get that out of a bunch of guys, that's pretty good, isn't it? Okay, here's what we're going to do for, the, for just a couple of seconds. Maybe you all don't know, but 14 of your people, including three boys, went to the Gridiron Men's Conference in Alabama. And for the last two days, we've been worshiping Jesus. And I want to tell you, we're on fire for the Lord today. Amen? Amen? So, yeah, you can clap for that. You guys, anybody out there like football? Put your hands up. Go ahead and admit it. You like football? Uh, you like baseball? Anybody like baseball? Uh, what do you do when your team hits a home run? What do you do? I mean, what do you do? Is that it? Really? Can you imagine 40,000 people in a stadium and two people go, whoo? <laughs> okay, let's try it again. 14 of your people spent the last 48 hours getting close to God. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's what I did, did last night. If anybody wants to, you can. I'm just going to give 90-second testimony, 90-second testimony. If anybody that went with me last night, you want to come up, just, just tell the church what God did in your heart. 90 seconds. If you want to do that, go. That means you come up here and grab a mic. And if nobody shows up, I'll testify for you, all right? I mean, I could say things like, come on, Bill. All right, come on. Say hello to Bill. Come on, brother. Uh, just real quickly, I just want to encourage for the, the men that didn't go. We, we've been going every year for a few years. Just go. You'll enjoy it. The Lord will bless your heart. Uh, you know, you go. Just like coming here today, you come with an open heart. That's the Lord will have words for you. He will touch your heart. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. <laughs> they call him Chulo. I don't know, man. Come on, Manny. Talk to us. Well, um, I was just so happy to be able to go. I went over there and I'll uh, tell you guys, I experienced healing in my soul like never before. Those men were able to speak into my life. And I was, I was just being set free and right on the spot. And I want to encourage you, if you get a chance next year to go, please go. Please go because God will meet you there. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Everybody say, hey, Joe. One of, the be one of the best parts was just the brotherhood of being with the guys as we went down there. We go to church together, but we really don't spend a lot of time together. We got to know each other really well, and God opened all of our hearts up. It was a great trip. Amen, buddy. Amen. And Joe bought my coffee, man. It was great. Anybody else? Anybody else want to come? Go. Say, hey, Dustin. Uh, the, fir the first thing that was, that was really cool that kind of touched me was uh, I'm a, I'm a planner. I, I like to have a plan. And we went down there with no plan, like no tickets, a plan. And, uh, somebody had a brilliant idea that we'd stand out and ask for tickets. So we got $1,400 of the tickets for 300 bucks. So that's faith in God. I mean, that's pretty cool. But the, the conference was called, uh, level. And what it was, was about balancing your life as a man between your job, being a dad and all those things. And I got to experience that, uh, with one boy, one of each of my boys on either side of me just worshiping the Lord, hands in the air, tears flowing at times. I mean, it was just, it was an incredible experience. Uh, the lineup next year is, is, is every bit as good, if not better than this year. Uh, don't miss it next year. If you don't think you can go, don't let that be, don't let that stand in your way. I mean, it, this was incredible. It was a great, great time. Thank you, buddy. All right. Amen. By the way, next year, uh, Lee Strobel will be there. Amen. Charlie Daniels will be there speaking next year. There you go. So um, y'all just need to come on. We're, we, had, we had a great time. Anybody else? All right. 
I want to publicly say thank you to David who went. David and I have been to Promise Keepers many times before. Hadn't done it in the last couple of years. Did this year. He drove. He drove his big mini bus thing that he's got, this huge thing. Got me back to church in time to preach last night. Thank you, buddy. Amen. <laughs> and everybody in his truck, we had a great time. We just kind of just snoozed. That thing there is just like, you know, it's like you're just flying or something. That, literally. Y'all got that, didn't you? We want to say thank you for Manny and Stella for making breakfast for us today. Thank you. Good. Um, are there any left? Okay, so now uh, some of you guys that's trying to watch your, your pennies, you know, just grab a burrito on the way out. And if you don't want to have to take your dad out for lunch, there you go. Just grab some. Amen. Today I want to preach to you on this Father's Day. There's, I've got a lot in my head because I want to tell you, I came back different from this men's conference. I came back refreshed and revived. Our series has been called Made New. I feel like I've been made new this weekend. I'm hearing things from God that I hadn't heard in a while. I know what I want to talk about and I know what I want to do, all right? Uh, I don't want same old, same old in a church. I don't want to just live the same old religious activity. I don't care nothing about that. I want to group together with some people that are passionate for God, and let's serve God together. That's what I want to do. Now, think about what we sang today. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. How many of you can say that? Now, now before we get really excited about saying yes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know what that means? My hope can't be in anything else out here. And see, too many people who come in on the weekend and say, my hope is built on nothing else. By the time you walk out the door, your hope's built on everything else, and that's why you're hopeless. We're going to sing in a minute. We're going to sing, It Is Well With My Soul. Anybody know that song? How many of you can actually sing, It Is Well With My Soul today? Now, do you know what your soul is? It's your intellect, your will, and your emotions. It's well with my soul. It is well with my soul means that when everything is messed up in my life, I'm still okay. But I want to profess to you that that's not most people's testimony. Most people's testimony is when God's close and, and they're serving God and everything's going their way. Oh, man, I'm all about this. But you let one problem come in and all of a sudden it is not well with my soul. And the reason why it's not well with your soul is because your hope is built on something else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We want to get right. We want revival. I want to get close to God. And problems really, and we learned this all weekend, didn't we, gridiron guys? And gridiron guys, you ought to be the loudest ones today, right? Amen. You're going to help me preach today, right? Because what we learned this weekend is... Problems don't mean things are bad in your life. Problems are things that God allows in your life so that you can grow. And how are you going to grow if all you ever do is fixate on the problem? Oh, man, man my life is so bad because look at this. I got this problem. and this. I know some people, they are professional at having problems. And they spend their whole life fixated on problems. You have to fixate on the Savior. Fix your eyes on him who has already conquered everything that you're going through. Man, we're just going to kill each other the way we're doing. And we're killing our soul. And our kids are suffering. I want to preach to you today on the cure for troubled kids. How many of you believe we got troubled kids? we got bad problems in the country right now. If you aren't aware, let me tell you. The teenagers that are coming up today are coming up way different than I did. In my generation, wasn't it, Jerry? It was a mess. But, Jerry, the things that are common in our kids' life now, you and I, we would like, how can that be? It is so far gone. And what's happening in the church too many times is we are the people that look at what's wrong and instead of being instruments of healing and help, we're instruments of condemnation and judging. 
And we look down at these and say, oh, they're doggone kids, they need to get their act together. You know why kids don't have their act together? Because their parents don't have their act together. People come to me a lot of times, I want you to counsel my kid. I'm like, no, I need to counsel you. Amen, Brother Brian, just preach. You know what I'm saying? Because kids can only do what they see and what you give them. Now, granted, you know, they've got a sin nature too. But it's time today, Father's Day 2017, that we decide that we're going to be responsible people in the sight of God. And we're going to say, you know what? We're going to make a difference and we're going to do this right. And I want to tell you, and I'm going to talk to the dads. Hey, ladies, is it okay if I talk to the dads? <laughs> Are the rest of you ladies trying to make up your mind or not? Is it okay? I mean, Stella says, yeah. I'm sure she's not talking about her poppy next, door, next to her, you know. I mean, is it okay if, it okay if I swing some sledgehammers of truth today? Is that all right? Uh, ladies, you're going to help me preach because the men are going to get real, real skirmish here in a minute. Some of you were here last night and you know exactly what's coming. But you know what? A real man of God will say, hit me again, Pastor. I like to go down to, to places like we were, Barry, and let, have somebody just beat me up. Because when God has corrected me, he is showing me that he loves me. If God didn't love me, he just let me go on my own way. And the next thing I'd know, my life would be out of control. You remember the recipe for shipwreck from last week? Some of you were here. How David, King David, shipwrecked his life. He started by inactivity. He was not involved in the kingdom's activities. Are y'all hearing me? See, there's something about serving God. If you're not actively serving God, if you're not involved in serving God, I want you to know you are inactive and you are on your way to a shipwrecked life. That's all there is to it. I know people say, well, no, Brother Brian, I just don't feel led. And I, I'm talking to some folks about, you know what? You got to get involved with a group of people that you can share with and receive from. See, we, we need to receive from each other. You know what I mean? We need to receive from each other. But some people are like, you know what? I just don't do groups. I just don't want to get along. I just don't want to be around other people. And, and I look at folks like that. I'm like, you're never going to get this. You're never going to get over your stuff. You're always going to be stuck. Maybe you think you're the first one. You're going to be the first one on the planet that's going to do things the wrong way and make it work. I rather doubt it. Amen? Now, they're starting to put some of this on the board, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to hear it. Five steps. We don't have to put it on the board yet because I'm going to read the Scripture. This is a long introduction, all right? You guys have already ate, so you all, you're okay. There's inactivity, then there's boredom. Then there's a compromising of convictions where you start doing what you thought you would never do. Then there's the hardening of the conscience where you don't even have a conscience anymore. And then finally, your life is out of control. And I want you to know that today, that is where many dads are. And today, because dads are that way, kids are that way. What is the cure for troubled kids? It's a dad. Scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 2 through 5. Listen to the Apostle Paul. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I submit to you today that Timothy was not the natural born son from Paul, but Paul is saying, Timothy, you are my dear son. And Paul is a made, do, made new dad. And he's speaking to a made new son. And he's giving all of us here today a recipe and a cure for the trouble that's in our lives. Let's go through the outline together, all right? 
Point number one, let's see the recipe for shipwreck fatherhood. It's the same as anything else. When King David wrecked his life, it started with inactivity. If you're going to be a shipwrecked father, the first thing that will happen is inactivity. You will not be involved in your kid's life. Too many kids have dads that are just simply people that are just kind of there. They're the ones that say, that think, I am the one that is called to provide. I go out and work every day. And when I get home, it is now me time, ladies and gentlemen. That is a recipe for disaster. Too many dads are totally inactive in their kid's life. They think they'll take their kids and sling their kids into the world and hope their kids can figure it out. And then when the kids can't figure it out, the father does nothing more than criticize. Did you know that the ministry of criticism is not one of the spiritual gifts? Anyone can find fault. But it takes a man to get in and be willing to humble himself to be a part of the solution for what's wrong in your kid's life. Inactive fathers are those that are concerned only for themselves. After inactivity, becomes there, there comes boredom. You see, in the shipwrecked dad's life, the desire for his life is disconnected from his family. I see this way too often. Too many dads are looking for life outside of the structure of what God has given you. I had a mentor that helped me with this some 20 years ago. And he taught me. And at the time I lived in Tennessee, he said, Brian, if you win everybody in Henry County, Tennessee, and you lose your family, you have lost and you have missed the first responsibility that God has given you. And too many men, because they are inactive in their kid's life, they're inactive in the life of their spouse, they get bored with life, and they start looking for life outside of the structure that God has given them. King David was bored. He was out on his roof because he was just hanging out doing nothing. He was inactive. And dads today, I want you to know that the cure for boredom is not another sports thing. It's not another trip to the outdoors. It's not all of these things. And hobbies are not a bad thing. But ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world where men have put everything in the world ahead of their families. And if you seek for life disconnected from the life that comes from Jesus, you'll never find that life. And these dads have a desire for life disconnected from their family. And the next step is they start compromising their convictions. In other words, they start living differently at home than they do everywhere else. You know what's tragic in the church today? There are many people that came into the church today to say, Yes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And they sing about Christ alone, the cornerstone. And they sing praises to God and they give praise to God. And by the time they get back home, a different dad has shown up. And what you're doing is you're compromising your convictions. Ladies and gentlemen and dads, let me say this to you today. If you're not worshiping God at home, it's not real anywhere else. What you are at home is who you are. What you are in the quiet place and the secret place is who you are. And too many dads are compromising convictions. I got a chance to hear David Jeremiah this weekend. Man, what a privilege to hear this guy that's 76 years old and still preaching. And he just hardly ever lifted his head from the table. But he had every one of us under conviction. Just nailed it. And he was talking about the state of the homes today. And I agree with him. I want you to know as a pastor and a Christian leader, I am sick to death of the problems we're having in our homes. You might think it'll never happen to me. All you have to do is get inactive, get bored, start compromising, and you can have the same kind of problem. He was talking about a man in his church that walked up to him and said, you know what? I'm leaving my family. 
I'm leaving my family of 20 years and my five kids. And, and David said, why are you doing that? And this little self-centered guy, he said, well, it's time for me to be true to myself. I thought, what a wimp. And how do you answer that? David Jeremiah said it like this. Well, what about being true to the word of God? What about being true to Jesus? What about being true to your five kids? What about being true to the spouse that you said that you would never leave her? What about being true to the church family that loves you? Ladies and gentlemen, when you give up on your family, it hurts everybody. One of these days, I'm going to preach about the anatomy of, of, of cheating and how it works. And, and because there's inactivity and boredom at home, then people start looking for life outside of the family structure. And then I guarantee you, if you start looking for something outside the family structure, there is someone named the devil who will provide that person for you. And then it starts to feel good. And then you start going, well, you know, it's just not good at home anymore. And someone's giving me attention. And the next thing you know, you're compromising your conviction. And the fourth step is that you harden your conscience. I don't think there's anything wrong with this anymore. Your actions are spiraling down. You start doing things that you never thought you would have ever done and finally, your life is out of control. The family's in chaos. The world's in chaos. Your friends are in chaos. Everything's in chaos. Ladies and gentlemen, that sounds just like the devil. And then we take that type of parenting, and it comes down to our kids. And we basically say, do what I say, not what I do. Let me give you a couple of pictures of some modern dads today. There's first the dad that is indifferent, the dad that just doesn't care, the dad that just kind of rolls with it because this dad is totally self-absorbed and his wife and his kids are just there. Maybe you had a dad like that. You see, the reason why you might be like that, sir, is because probably your father was like that to you. Amen? There's another picture. There's a dad that's impossible to please. Maybe you had that type of situation. One of the speakers this weekend told a story about when he was a boy. I'll just say this to you, men. I'll just say this to you, men. Every man in here, they might not admit it publicly, but every man in this room can remember the hurts that they received as a boy. And in particular, if it came from your dad. One of the speakers, I think it was the same speaker, was talking about prison ministry. And how that he was involved in prison ministry. And when, when you're involved in prison ministry, you find out something startling. Most every man in prison, a good majority of them, hate their father. I wonder how that happened. I mean, think about the day that child was born and fast forward 25 years later and the child that was born that you held into your hand and thank God for one day would have nothing but disgust for you. And most people say, it'll never happen to me. My answer is always the same. In that case, you'll be the first. And I really doubt it. This one man was talking about what happened to him as a child. He was a little boy, and he was on the baseball team. He wasn't a good baseball player. When I played baseball, I could pitch, but I couldn't hit. I couldn't hit, I couldn't hit the broad side of anything. I just couldn't do it, but I loved to pitch. But I did get on base a few times. Well, this guy, he never got on base. He was the kid... I mean, he was there to be there with his friends. He enjoyed it. He wasn't like, you know, he didn't feel slighted. He was a guy, they, they, he said they put him in the outfield because, they, the, you know, he, he just wasn't very good. And when he, when he batted, every time he went to the plate, he prayed for a walk because he knew he couldn't hit the ball. 
Well, he said one time the pitcher threw the ball and he swung the bat and guess what? He hit it. So he really didn't know what to do. And he said he hit it so far and got into the outfield. And, and so he starts running. And he runs to first base, but he'd never been to second base, so he really didn't know what to do. And so they had to tell him, run, 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 go to second. So he went to second, and he got to second, didn't know what to do. And they kept yelling, run, 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 go to third. And he got to third. By the time he got to third, the coach stopped him because the other team had got the ball back in the infield. And he was like, huh, got me a triple. His dad was in the stands. And you would think that a dad would say, out of way, bud. That a way to hit the ball. Triple, man. That's good. No, his dad didn't say that. His dad said, if you hadn't stumbled around second and first, you'd have got a home run. And some of you had a dad like that. It was impossible to please. And some of you are fathers just like that. Some of you are angry. There's a lot of angry dads in the world. And you know the problem with being an angry dad is that you're the only one that doesn't know that you're angry. Everyone else in your life knows it. If everyone else is tiptoeing around you, you know why? It's because there's an elephant in the room. And if there's an elephant in the room, you don't want to wake him up. If you've got courage today, man, if you've got courage, go home and ask your family. Ask them, say, is this one of me? Is this who I am? And then there's another picture. Of a dad that's not there. Just not there. Gone somewhere. And you take these type of shipwrecked dads and it produces shipwrecked kids. But I want you to know today, this is a hopeful message. I know it's a little rough right now, but it's hopeful. Because there is power in Jesus Christ to change anything. And anyone that be willing today, Jesus Christ can make you new today. We need some made new kids. And in order to get some made new kids, we need some made new dads. Let me talk to you about what made new kids need. This is where you're going to fill some things in. First, made new kids need connection. They need connection. I get emotional when I think about it. For years, for years I've been going to these men's conferences all the way back when my boys were young, and I can remember being in those football fields. Back then they had stadium events, 40, 50,000 guys. Being there with my, my sons, worshiping together. I can still see that. And then this weekend, I got to go with my son-in-law and my grandson. I got to stand there with my grandson standing on the chair, one arm around him, and my hand up like this, and his hand is up like this. I want you to understand, there's not anything that you can do any better than connecting with your kids in worship. You know, they, they need connection. They, they, they don't need you just to kind of, you know, be there for the fun stuff. The fun stuff is good, but they need connection. And they need to see you worshiping. And you need to bring them in with you to worship. Dr. Gary Rosberg, we're going to put that picture up in a moment. Just hang tough with me. Dr. Gary Rosberg is, he and his wife Barb are called America's Family Coaches. And he's a Christian psychologist. And he tells a story. He tells a story about when he was in graduate school and he was getting ready to, to get his degree, and he was working toward his future, which are all good things. And, and, and he was working full-time and in school full-time and it was a very busy time in their life. Any men know what I'm talking about right there? You got your goals, which are good. You got your thing. You got your head going that direction. I'm going to take care of all this. See, I got my family. I love my family over here. And I'm going to do what I got to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to be responsible. And I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make sure because I got my family over here. And I'm going to do what I got to do. And I'm going to make sure they're taken care of because I love my family. So I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done. What he did was one morning he was getting ready to go to work. And his daughter, Missy. Walked up to him and said, Daddy, Daddy, little girl. She said, I drew a picture of our family. And she showed the picture to her dad. And he said, Missy, I love, 
I love your, your picture and, and gave her a little kiss and he said, I'm going to take this picture and I'm going to put it uh, in my office so I'll have it there so I can see it. And so he gave his little girl a kiss and he went to work. But all day long, something was wrong. He couldn't figure it out. There was something wrong. When he got back home, he walked into his office and he looked at the picture. And as this little girl drew a picture of mom and the kids and the dog, there was one person that wasn't in the picture and it was him. And so he, he said, he went to Missy and said, Missy, you know, I really love your picture. I really like this picture, but you know, Missy... I see mommy and I see sister and I see the little dog and where's daddy? And she said, daddy's at the library. And he realized my family doesn't know me. And he said he went that night and uh, he said it just wrecked him. And he said it was, it was late at night and he was still tore up and he's decided, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm losing at home. I'm losing the most important things to me. I'm seeking everything. These are kind of good things, but I'm losing at home. And so he went in to his wife's room where his wife was asleep and he was going to talk to her. And he said, Barb, are you still awake? And she said, yes. And he said, rats, because he was going to practice first. But she was awake, and he said, Barb, that picture wrecked me. And she looked up at him and said, Gary, we all love you, but we don't any of us know you because you're not here. He said, Barb, I want to come home. And he got right before his God and his spouse and his family that night, and he began to work on it. He began to work on his relationship, and here's how he worked on it. He worked on it by doing something he calls taking the temperature. And he would ask his kids and his wife two things. Listen, guys, very important. He would ask them, number one, how am I doing? And number two, what do you need from me? He began to serve his family, and a few months later, Missy came and drew another picture and there he is right in the middle of it. That's what it looks like to win. And men, you can cheer that one right there because that's where we want to be. Right in the middle of what God has given us. Your kids need connection. They need your time. Not only do they need connection, but they need your affection. They need some meaningful touch. They need their, the man of their life, their dad in their life, to put his arms around them in a meaningful way and communicate to them how he feels about them. Not only do they need connection and affection, but they need direction. They need direction. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about your daughters right now. Your daughters are trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life. And if you don't show them anything, they're not going to get it. I want to quote psychologist Dr. Meg Meeker. It's a little bit lengthy, but listen. This is a blog. You can find it on the internet. Dr. Meeker says, men, we need you. We, mothers, daughters, and sisters, need your help to raise healthy young women. We need every ounce of masculine courage and wit you own because fathers, more than anyone else, set the course for a daughter's life. Are you guys hearing that? I want to tell you something, men. You can't be a wimp and be a dad. After more than 20 years of listening to daughters and doling out antibiotics, antidepressants, and stimulants to girls who have gone without a father's love, I know just how important fathers are. I have listened hour after hour, listen to this, it'll break your heart, to young girls describe how they vomit in junior high bathrooms to keep their weight down. I have listened to 14-year-old girls tell me they have to provide sex acts that disgust them in order to keep their boyfriends. 
I've watched girls drop off varsity tennis teams, flunk out of school, carve initials and tattoo cult figures into their bodies, all to see if their dads will notice. Fathers, more than anyone else, set the course for a daughter's life. Many fathers, particularly of teen girls, assume that they have little influence over their daughters in the light of their daughter's peers and pop culture. And they think their daughters need to figure out life on their own. But your daughter, sir, faces a world markedly different from the one you grew up with. It is less friendly, morally unmoored, and even outright dangerous. Listen to this. Struck me so hard. After age six, little girl clothes are hard to find. Many outfits are cut to make her look like a seductive 13 or 14-year-old girl trying to attract older boys. The research shows that girls disconnected from their, from their fathers go through puberty sooner and start sexual activity much sooner. She will see sexual innuendo and scenes of overt sexual behavior in magazines or on television before she is 10 years old, whether you approve or not. Fathers are what stands between their daughters and a toxic world. Men, when our daughters are walking around through life with body parts hanging out, she is telling the world that she needs connection and she needs it from you. Young lady, if that's the way that you dress in that provocative way, understand something that's never going to provide for you what you're looking for. And if your dad's not willing to provide that connection, the only thing I can tell you to do today, and this solves everything, is go to the love of your heavenly father. He will never cause you to compromise truth in order to receive affection. He just simply knows your name and he loves you unconditionally. They need direction. Sir, you need to tell that daughter, no, you can't dress like that. We live in a day right now where dads are afraid that somebody will say something negative about them if they try to parent their kids. If you don't parent your daughter, who's going to? Many of us know, we know, well, what's happening is not right and where they're going is not right. They go all hours of the night. They go unchaperoned in places. Men, do you not understand that the world that we live in now is so sexualized your daughters have the ability to do things right under your nose and you have no idea about it. We take things like this and we hand it to children at a young age and we just disconnect from them. We have no idea what they're doing. Listen, every godly dad ought to be able to say, give me your phone. There are actually apps where children can do things and expose themselves to other people. And it's gone in 15 seconds. Sir, did you know that? Did you know that your daughter may be participating in this type of activity? No, what usually happens is because we're bored and we're inactive and we're not involved. And all, we just kind of go our way. And then one day we come in and boom, life changes because we find out that things were not as good as we thought they were. And then we become that angry dad that just looks down our nose and say, how dare you disgrace me and disgrace my family. Ought not be that way, guys. Not only do they need direction, but they need redemption. They need redemption. Let me tell you, men, your daughters are going to fail. Your sons are going to fail. And what they need from you is the same redemption that Jesus Christ has given you. You see, the thing about Jesus is this. When you come to Jesus and say, I've messed up, he says, I got you covered. Amen. When you come to Jesus and say, I got it all under control, you're still stuck in your sins. And when your children come to you and they need something and they've messed up, it's time for the redemptive power of parenting to come in. Redemption changes people. Changes me. What does a picture of a made do, new dad look like? 
Let me give it to you quickly. First, he shows affection. He shows affection. Paul said, Timothy, he called him, my dear son. Is that how you talk about your kids? Men, that's a little odd, isn't it? Doesn't it feel a little funny to go to our sons and go, you're very dear to me, isn't it? We got to get past that. He said, Timothy, I long to see you. He said, Timothy, you bring joy to me. Ladies and gentlemen, I've not always done this right. In fact, more of my life, I haven't done it right. But I want to tell you today, I want to be a made new dad. And I want to be an instrument that shows affection to my children. Not only does he show affection, but he gives his blessing. He gives his blessing. Paul said to Timothy, he said, I pray for you all the time. Hey, dads, look up here. Are you praying all the time for your children? Too many dads are like, well, I'm kind of busy. You see what your problem is? Busy can kill you and can kill your family. Paul said grace, mercy, and peace to his son. What would your kids do if you just walked up to them, put your hands on them, and said, I pray God's grace over you today? That's what your kids need. He shows affection. He gives his blessing. He sets a good example. Paul said, Timothy, the God whom I, whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. You know, we talked about the conscience being hardened. Paul's like, my conscience is clear. And you know what your kids will know? You know what your kids will know when your conscience is clear and you're serving God? They're going to like, yeah, there's something to this God thing. Do you want your kids to catch it? You see, leadership is more caught than taught. You can teach all day long, but if you don't live it, they're not going to catch it. And all they're going to learn is dysfunction from you. Paul's conscience is clear. He is serving God. A side note about this is simply this. Serving and clear conscience are definitely connected. They're definitely connected. If you are not serving God, you don't have a clear conscience. If you have a clear conscience without serving God, probably you're not even saved. Because you have missed the purpose for why God has put you here. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings. You know what Paul said? Timothy, my dear son, who gives me joy, whom I long to see. He said, Timothy, you know my life. What would happen if you went home and got your kids around the table and your wife around the table and say, Tell me in three minutes what you know about me. Would it be all about your faith and your love and your perseverance? And your blessing? Or would they tell you something else? If they tell you something else, it means you need to be made new. The right example is one of total surrender to the Lord. Total surrender to the Lord. I want to tell you, it's impossible to be in the ministry and not be surrendered to the Lord. It's possible to be a part of all types of things in the church and not be totally surrendered to the Lord. It's possible to be someone who names the name of Jesus and be aloof to the things of God. But I want you to know that it is God's will and our joy today to come before God and say, Here I am, Lord, I give it all to you. Because, ladies and gentlemen, made new kids need made new dads. And so you can do this today. You can get it right today. All you have to do is admit the truth. And once you admit the truth, God will make you new. And ladies and gentlemen, when you admit the truth, then get active. Do you hear what I'm saying? Get active. Say active. You can connect. You can connect with your family. You can connect with the Lord. You can connect with the church. You can learn when you're connected to the Lord, then you can give affection. You can show affection. You can give your blessing. You can provide the direction. You know how I know? God wouldn't have given you his, that family if God didn't believe you could do it. You can do this. You can provide redemption because we've been redeemed. You can provide forgiveness because we've been forgiven. You can provide encouragement to your kids because you've been encouraged. You can provide the blessing because you've been blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, active people in the kingdom of God are never bored. So today, get in the word. 
Teach the kids the word. Live out the word. Walk in freedom alongside the Lord. Overcome the enemy. Experience the Lord's grace and and peace. And ladies and gentlemen, your life will be in order. And you will experience the presence of Almighty God. And the problems will not stop you anymore. And your children will understand what it means to serve God Almighty. And they will get it. And you will live with made new kids today now what happens when you hit a home run what happens when you hit a home run that news is good news today let's praise him today for what he's done for us